Blog Talk Radio. Good evening. Welcome to Mystery Babylon News Radio with Walt Stickle. My name's Tom Press, guest hosting. Walt has asked me to come and continue the series, The Diabolical Jesuit Roots of the New World Order. And last time on the program, we talked about preterism, that school of Bible interpretation, or rather prophecy interpretation, that puts the fulfillment of the, of the book of Revelation uh, to have been completed along about 70 A.D. And that belief system teaches that the Antichrist, or the Antichrist power spoken of in the Bible, prophesied to arise in the world, was either Vespasian or Titus or Alexander the Great or, or uh, Nero or one of the, the pagan Roman Caesars, and that since the destruction of those personalities, the Antichrist power is no longer a factor in the Christian world, and that what Christianity must do now is not to contend with the Antichrist because he is history, but to now fashion the world in preparation for Christ's return. In other words, conquer the world for Christianity. And that is partly what we see today, especially with the United States and all of our foreign wars. And now, obviously, I'm suggesting that the wars that are fought by the United States are, in fact, for the good of the papacy in the process of conquering the nations for an eventual rule of the papacy on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. Now, the preterist school of interpretation of Bible prophecy is not widely believed anymore. What has become popular is the, the lie, the great deception that I believed for 50 years of my life. It's called dispensational futurism. And it's taught in virtually all the Protestant churches today, if they can call themselves Protestant. Let's just call them evangelical churches. And the futurist interpretation of Bible prophecy says that Antichrist has not yet arrived in the world and won't be a factor in Christendom until seven years or three and a half years before Christ's return. And that, too, is a lie. Both of these schools of Bible interpretation, preterism and futurism, have one purpose and one author. The author is the Jesuit order of the, the militia of the Pope. And the purpose is to destroy Protestantism. Remember, the Jesuit oath swears that the Jesuit order will destroy Protestantism and open the way for the papacy to rule and reign the world as a sovereign, a global sovereign monarch. That is the New World Order. Now, during the Protestant Reformation, by way of reviewing, the Protestant reformers were neither preterist nor futurists. They did not believe that Antichrist was destroyed in the old Roman Empire or prior to 70 AD and the destruction of the temple. They believed, or rather, they did not believe that Antichrist was some distant future single individual that would arrive on the world scene just before Christ returned. The Protestant reformers to the man, every single one of them, in other words, were what we call historicists. And not only were the Protestant reformers historicists, but so were every Bible-believing Christian prior to the Protestant Reformation, such as the Waldenses. Now, what fueled 
the Protestant Reformation, what made the Protestant Reformation so profound in, in Europe was it, it literally came after the Bible was translated into the common languages of the people. So that for the first time in their life, they were able to read the scriptures for themselves in their own language. And they didn't need a Roman Catholic priest anymore to tell them what the Bible said or what it meant. And what they discovered by reading the scriptures for themselves was that the Bible painted an unmistakable portrait of the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church as being the Antichrist and the Antichrist power that would deceive the whole world and persecute God's people. And because of that knowledge, as it spread throughout Europe, people rebelled against the Roman Catholic Church, left the Roman Catholic Church, and joined the Protestant Reformation in agreement that the papacy fulfills all the Bible prophecies regarding the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist that deceives the whole world. They read the book of Revelation chapter 17 and 18, and in that they discovered a color portrait of the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy and its eventual destruction by Christ. Now, before we even begin, I want you to get it in your mind, and I will prove, as we continue in this study, that futurism was created by the Jesuit order for the very purpose of exonerating the papacy of the onus of Antichrist. In other words, making the world believe that the Protestant reformers were wrong, that the Pope is not Antichrist, that Antichrist is a singular individual that will come in the far distant future just before Christ's return, and that the Protestant Reformation, the rebellion against the Roman Catholic Church, the rebellion against the spiritual and temporal authority of the Pope, was the greatest injustice against the very throne of God Almighty, the papacy. And that once believed, once believed that the Protestant Reformation made this grievous error and pronouncing the Pope Antichrist, that they would not only return to the Roman Catholic Church, but then make reparations to the Vatican or to the papacy by helping to restore his spiritual and temporal power, not only over Europe, but over the whole world. That is the New World Order. Now, we're going to discover the mechanics, the names and the faces through which futurism got a hold in Protestantism and turned the Protestants against the Protestant faith against the historicist view of Bible prophecy and on to a lie. And I call it the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden, with nearly as much consequence as the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. Now, the author is going to describe for us the futurist view. This is a Jesuit view. It was created by the Jesuit order to defeat the Protestant Reformation and to restore the papacy to his quote-unquote rightful throne as monarch of the world, the very vicar of Jesus Christ himself on the earth. Now, the other school, known as the Futurists, said that this great power must be future, this Antichrist power must be future, teaching that it would not appear in the world until the second advent of Jesus Christ. The originator of this second erroneous thesis was a Spanish Jesuit priest by the name of Francisco Ribera in 1590. Now, I'm going to spell his last name because it's often... Uh, misspelled, and if you go to do your own research on this man, 
you'll invariably get the wrong name. Francisco is common spelling. F R A N C uh, I S C O. F R A N C I S C O. And the last name is spelled R I B as in boy E R A. R I B E R A. Ribera. Now, as he attempted to advance the Roman counter-reformation. Remember, we've been through the Jesuit oath, and we've seen by the oath that they take that they are sworn to destroy Protestantism as a necessary means to elevate the papacy to global supremacy. Now, it stands to reason that if there are still Protestants in the world who insist that the papacy was, is, and always will be the Antichrist of Scripture, the Antichrist of the Bible, then it will be virtually impossible to achieve a global sovereign rule for the papacy. There will be too much opposition in the world. So, since the Vatican could not destroy all these Bibles that were being printed in the language of the people, nor could they destroy all of the Protestants who read them, and they did make the attempt to destroy both the Bible and those who read it. They had to surrender the idea that the only way that they could defeat Protestantism was to deceive the Protestants and to shift the onus away from the papacy and on to some singular individual at the, end of the, at the end of time. This is that deception, futurism. It says, as he attempted to advance the Roman counter-reformation, remember the Jesuits are the militia of the Pope, it is their job, their sworn oath and duty to destroy Protestantism, and then, having destroyed Protestantism, elevate the papacy once again to global supremacy, it says, Ribera, this Jesuit priest, Francisco Ribera, was embarrassed by the persistent Protestant identification of the papacy with the Antichrist. Okay, this Jesuit priest is sworn to elevate the papacy to global supremacy, and this this persistent Protestant identification of the papacy as being the Antichrist stood in the way of that accomplishment. So, to counter this, he revived a futurist interpretation for the book of Revelation. He placed all but the first three chapters of the book in the future. Okay? Now, what is the purpose of this? To shift the onus of Antichrist away from the papacy and on to some distant future individual. All right. Now, remember also that Ribera revived an existing futurist interpretation of the prophecies. It, some of the tenets of what Francisco Ribera taught came from earlier writings, came from earlier works, and it stands to reason that any Roman Catholic who had lived with the Protestants screaming in their ears, the papacy is the Antichrist, the papacy is the Antichrist, get out of the Roman Catholic Church before it's too late. They simply had to come up with an answer to the Protestant accusation of the Pope being the Antichrist. Now, in this futurist interpretation of the Scripture, it says, Antichrist was restored to a person and an individual ruler, not the papacy, who would arise in the future. Okay? So they, they shifted the blame from the papacy to some future individual. It says, Antichrist would reign for three and one-half years and his teaching was embellished with a rebuilding of the temple at Jerusalem, 
revival of the Levitical laws and sacrifices, plus various Jewish aspects in addition to the wholly unfulfilled persecution of the church. This futurist interpretation was popularized by Jesuit priest Cardinal Bellarmine and became widely accepted within the Roman Catholic Church. Now, let's review just a little bit here. First of all, this futurist idea says that the Antichrist would only reign from a period beginning about three and one-half years before Christ's return, and that it would consist of, it would coincide with the rebuilding of a temple in Jerusalem and revival of Levitical laws and sacrifices. Now, where do you suppose this Jesuit got this idea? Clearly, from our study that we led off with in this series, <coughs> our study of Daniel's prophecy in chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. And I will read the pertinent part that insists that there must be a, 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 a Jewish temple built and animal sacrifices restored. And you will see, as I have already asserted, that they have twisted Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27 from a historicist interpretation to a future interpretation by simply changing the identity of who is spoken about in that prophecy. Now, here it is. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. This is the verse that the Jesuits have twisted in order to deceive the whole world, to first bring into question the true identity of Antichrist, and then to open the way for a future refulfillment of this prophecy and a false Christ. Here is the passage. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, that is, one seven-year period of time. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblations to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. First of all, common sense dictates if you read verses 24 through 27 in context, that he spoken of in Daniel 9.27 is none other than Jesus Christ. And this prophecy was fulfilled completely and perfectly by Jesus Christ himself 2,000 years ago. The 70th week of Daniel was the ministry of Christ, beginning at his anointing in the River Jordan by John the Baptist. Three and one-half years later, in the midst of the week, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease by giving up his own life, by becoming the Lamb of God, the supreme sacrifice, the once and for all, all-sufficient blood sacrifice that washes away the sin of the world. And, and for the overspreading of abominations, in other words, thus indicating that the Jews would not accept his sacrifice, but can wish to continue their sacrificial system, would continue these and it is these sacrifices, and it is it is referred to here as the overspreading of abominations. And because because of these abominations, these animal sacrifices that the Jews continued to make even after Jesus shed his own blood for them, it says he, Christ, shall make it, the temple, desolate. Now remember in the scriptures, Jesus said, your house is left unto you desolate. That's the fulfillment of this prophecy. 
This prophecy, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, was fulfilled to the letter by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. Not only did he say, your house is left unto you desolate, he never once mentioned that they ought to sometime in the future rebuild their temple and continue these abominations. And therefore he said that their house would be desolate even until the consummation. Now some would argue that the, what is this consummation speaking of? Some would argue that it speaks about the war that took place in 70 A.D., whereby this temple was destroyed, and another one of Jesus' prophecies came to perfect fulfillment in that not one stone remained upon the other of that temple. But I believe what this word consummation is speaking of is literally Christ's return. So in that view, let us read it this way. And for the overspreading of abominations, Jesus shall make the temple desolate, even until his return. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. That is the judgment. That which is determined. That which has been determined in the court of heaven shall be poured upon the desolate. Those who have not Christ are the desolate. Those whose temples they are are empty of Jesus Christ. They have not made Jesus Christ their lamb. They are desolate. The Spirit of God does not dwell in them. They have rejected Jesus Christ and his sacrifice and they shall remain desolate, even unto the consummation. And that determined, the counsel of God, the judgment shall sit, and desolation will describe those who have rejected Christ. God's wrath will be poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, They've had 2,000 years to acknowledge that it was Jesus who fulfilled this prophecy. And instead of accepting Jesus as the fulfillment of this prophecy, they seek for a future fulfillment in rejection of Jesus Christ. And what we're seeing is a literal man-made creation, or rather recreation, of the nation-state of Israel and then forcing through, through holocausts and inquisitions and other forms of Jewish persecution to drive Jews down to this land that they have created for the Jews, not for their salvation, but for their virtual annihilation. I believe that the, the, the modern nation state of Israel was created for one purpose and one purpose only. And that was the final Jewish question. What they failed to accomplish during the First World War, the Second World War, they planned to completely accomplish in the coming war in Jerusalem. They want to destroy all the Jews, those who brought us the oracles of God. They don't pray for their salvation. They don't proselytize Jews to accept their lamb, which they rejected 2,000 years ago. No, they teach them that they need to come back down to Israel and build a temple and begin animal sacrifices once again and eat and drink damnation to themselves just like they did 2,000 years ago after Jesus paid it all. And who is it? Who is it that desires to to destroy all the Jews? Why, those who say they have replaced the Jews, the papacy, and the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholics are to believe, according to Roman Catholicism, as a dogma of the faith, that they have replaced the Jews, that they are the one true holy, Roman Catholic, and apostolic church, outside of which there is no salvation. 
They claim that Jesus Christ started the Roman Catholic Church and that it is only through the papacy that salvation may be obtained. They believe in replacement theology, that the Jews are to be destroyed as heretics, having rejected Christ, and that the Roman Catholics replace them as God's chosen people. That is the true teaching of Roman Catholicism. Now, I do not believe anybody replaces the Jews. The body of Christ consists, consists of every nation, people, tongue, and, 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 and nation. The body of Christ is Christ's body. And he's no respecter of persons. But you must believe in the shed blood of Jesus Christ as your only hope in salvation. That can't be said of either Jew or Roman Catholic. Now, I don't want to get into a big discussion yet about what Roman Catholicism teaches. I want to continue on our discussion about futurism. Now again, it says, Antichrist, according to the futurist interpretation of Bible prophecy, particularly Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27, Antichrist would reign for three and one half years, and his teaching was embellished with a rebuilding of the Jewish temple, revival of the Levitical laws and sacrifices, plus various Jewish aspects in addition to the wholly unfulfilled persecution of the church. This futuristic interpretation was popularized by Cardinal, Jesuit Cardinal, Bellarmine, and became widely accepted within the Roman Catholic Church. Now, obviously, you must understand that it became widely accepted within the Roman Catholic Church because it exonerates the papacy. You cannot believe that the papacy fulfills all the Bible prophecies regarding Antichrist when Antichrist doesn't come to the very end of time. And it's one individual. It's not, according to their teaching, is not linked to the papacy or the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, the strategy here is to destroy the Protestant Reformation. And by shedding the onus away from the papacy as Antichrist and putting it on a future single individual, they have destroyed Protestantism. Now, many of you are going to say, well, I consider myself a Protestant, but I don't believe the papacy is the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, as Tom says. But I insist, as would any and all of the Protestant reformers and the Waldenses that preceded them by centuries, if you do not believe that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of Scripture, you cannot rightly call yourself a Protestant. Now, you may call yourself a non-Roman Catholic, but you cannot in any way call yourself a Protestant. And I came to the realization in my life, though I profess Protestantism, knowing nothing about Roman Catholicism, I was not Protestant, because I didn't even know what Protestantism was. I didn't even understand that the word Protestant, the root of the word, is protest. Nor did I even ask the question, who did they protest? They protested the Antichrist of the Bible, the papacy. Now, Look what they did to confuse this issue. Look what they did to verse 27. They say that the he spoken of there is not Jesus Christ. That this verse was not fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. They say that the he spoken of there is a single individual coming upon the world scene at the very end of time, within like seven years before Christ's return. And it says, He, the Antichrist, not the Messiah, but
but the Antichrist shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And they say that covenant will be with the Jews. And he will make a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews, who are now living in the land since 1948. The the state of Israel became a state in 1948. They say that is God's fulfillment of this prophecy, which is clearly erroneous. He said, not only will... This this presupposes that not only will there be a nation-state of Israel on the Mediterranean in its old location, but that that Jerusalem will be the center of of its worship. And that this Antichrist figure will make a covenant with the Jews for one week, one seven year period of time. And that in the midst of the week, the Antichrist shall cause the sacrifice and oblations to cease. Now, they have told me for 50 years that this covenant that would be issued for one seven-year period of time would allow the Jews to begin animal sacrifices and oblations once again in a rebuilt temple. And, And I believed it. It was taught to me in every church that I went to. And I went to several. They all taught it the same way. That Antichrist will confirm a covenant with the Jews for one week, and in the midst of the week, the Antichrist shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured up upon the desolate. They call this the seven years of great tribulation. That when the Antichrist signs a seven-year peace treaty with Israel, allowing them to begin animal sacrifices and oblations once again in Temple Mount worship, after three and one-half years, the Antichrist, who, who, who gave them that covenant, will break the covenant and cause them to stop animal sacrifices. Now, when that happens, the whole Christian world, those who have been taught futurism all their lives, will be irrevocably convinced that this man who signed the the, the treaty with the Jews to allow them to begin animal sacrifices again, and after three and a half years renege on the treaty and stop those sacrifices will be the Antichrist of the Bible. And there will be absolutely no way without the assistance of the Holy Spirit to convince them otherwise. Because for at least the last three generations of Protestants in this country, that's what we've been taught. That this was not Jesus who confirmed the covenant. First of all, you have to ask yourself, how in the world can you confirm a covenant that doesn't already exist? I mean, you can make a covenant that doesn't already exist, but how do you confirm a covenant that doesn't already that doesn't already exist? Well, if it already exists, what covenant is that? It's the covenant in Jesus' blood. It was He who became the sacrifice. It was He who, when He said, It is finished. God signified the finishing of that last sacrifice by ripping the veil of the temple, by ripping that veil that hung between the holy place and the most holy place. Now, it stands to reason that if God ripped that veil from top to bottom, signifying that it was God who ripped it, the Holy of Holies was wide open. Anyone could enter the Holy of Holies. Whereas before, only the great high priest of Israel, once a year, after fully confessing his sins, making sacrifice for himself, because he was a sinner, just like all flesh, once making sacrifice for himself, once being purified, ritually purified, 
only then could pass through the veil and offer the blood sacrifice on the, the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. And if anyone other than the great high priest, after being once completely sanctified for that, that service, that once a year service, only he could go into the Holy of Holies past the veil. If anyone looked upon that Ark of the Covenant, not being fully consecrated to offer the sacrifice, to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, they would be killed. The Holy of Holies was a dangerous place. You did not dare go in there unless you had a blood sacrifice in your hand and after, and then only after making sacrifice for yourself to cleanse yourself from sin. That was the job of the great high priest of Israel. But once that veil was ripped from top to bottom, signifying that it was God who did it, the Holy of Holies was open, the, the, the whole temple would have become a death trap, except for one thing. We had been reconciled to God. Jesus had fulfilled the covenant, a covenant that pre-existed, the covenant that the prophets spoke of, that he would die, but not for himself, says Daniel. In verse 26, it says, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, but for you and me. Now, when that veil was ripped from top to bottom, and if someone other than the high priest walked into the temple with that veil open and the mercy seat exposed, they would have been instantly consumed if not for the fact that Jesus fulfilled that covenant. A covenant that he confirmed with his own blood and was witnessed by anyone who walked in that temple and was alive to walk out of it. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, is speaking of none other than Jesus Christ. Now, many will argue with me and say, no, it's speaking of the Antichrist. Because it says in verse uh, verse 26, it says, And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And they say that this prince that shall come is the subject of verse 27 that it is this prince that shall come that destroyed the city and the sanctuary is the one spoken of in verse 27. And they interpret that to mean the Antichrist. But let me make this simple for you. The subject of that clause that says, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Who was it who destroyed the city and the sanctuary? It was the people of the prince. People is many, not one. You cannot describe people as he. You can describe a prince as he, but you cannot describe people as he. We simply have to understand that if the he spoken of in verse 27 refers to anything in the above verse, verse 26, it must be the people of the prince that shall come. Plural. In other words, Daniel, if, if it's, it's simply referring to the people of the prince that shall come to destroy the city and the sanctuary, Verse 
chapter 9, verse 27 would say, And they shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, they shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. But some even now will insist that the he spoken of in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, is talking about this prince that shall come. Do you know who the prince was that came and destroyed the city and the sanctuary? Or more correctly, the people that he brought with him who destroyed the city and the sanctuary? You know who that prince was? His name was Titus. He was the son of the current Caesar, Vespasian. Now, what is the son of the Caesar typically called? A prince. What is the son of God referred to? The Son of God Almighty, Jesus Christ. How is he referred to in the Scripture? The Prince of Peace. He's the Son of the Father. He is a prince. And so was Titus, a son of his father, Vespasian. And he brought with him a horde of hirelings and Romans to invade Israel, to invade Jerusalem, to cordon the city, to starve the people out, to eventually break through the cordon and destroy the people and the temple and not leave one stone left upon another. Prince Titus did not do that himself. My guess is Prince Titus, being the son of Caesar, probably didn't even dirty his hands that day. Are you beginning to see the truth here? Are you beginning to see the truth? This key spoken of in verse 27 cannot be many. It can only be one. So who is it speaking of? but Jesus Christ himself. Now this very twisting of the idea, of the identity of who this he is in verse 27 is the very foundation of, de of Jesuit-inspired dispensational futurism. It is the foundation of the Jesuit-led Counter-Reformation. It is the very foundation of the New World Order. Because if in a day all Bible-believing Christians finally came to the perfect realization that the he spoken of in verse 27 is not Antichrist, but Jesus Christ himself, that puts the onus back on the papacy. The papacy becomes the Antichrist. The Protestant Reformation was a move of the Holy Spirit of Almighty God. And we should flee the Roman Catholic Church, end our ecumenical dialogue with the man of sin, the son of perdition, and put Christ back in our hearts and restore our temples to holiness. But until we do, the Vatican-led, Jesuit-led New World Order will continue marching on, and God's people will continue to be persecuted and annihilated, just as they have for the last 1,500 years. I've come to the end of the broadcast. We'll see you next Wednesday here on Mystery Babylon News Radio with Walt Stickle. My name's Tom Press. Good evening.